thank you everyone for joining. This was intended to be a Christmas uh, fireside chat uh, before leaving for vacations, but a lot of uh, things happened that moved the event uh, to this date. Um, we're excited about this. Um, uh, Alex Lazarov um, wrote a book uh, which is called Out Innovate, and we feel that it's very close to the heart of Endeavor and the DNA of our organization, right? It's a, it talks about how entrepreneurs outside Silicon Valley can have transformative effect in local economies. And this is exactly what uh, Endeavor is tro also trying to do. And we thought that this is something, it's a really nice opportunity to invite um, a very close group. We only invited 30 people, um, uh, which are board members, Endeavor entrepreneurs, ambassadors, uh, and high level mentors, which we want to include in a um, uh, top level discussion about the strategy and the future of organization. And um, we asked Alexandros Hatzilefteriou, Andreas Stavropoulos, uh, a board member of Endeavor Greece and an Endeavor entrepreneur to lead the discussion. First of all, uh, kind of, you know, have Alexander uh, tell us about more of his process and his key lessons from this, uh, from writing the book, and then open it up to the strategy of Endeavor Greece and what it all means for Greece. So, uh, Alexandre, Andreas, thank you so much for um, offering your time and your um, stepping into uh, moderate this, this discussion. Uh, Alexander, of course, thank you for your time and joining this discussion about uh, your book and Greece. You want us to take it away? Or yes, do you want to, do you want to, oh, well, okay, let me just say maybe uh, just uh, two words on me and then Alexandre, see if you can just say a couple of words about yourself and then uh, we turn to our honored guest. Uh, so I, I'm in Silicon Valley myself. Uh, the book and some of the concepts here ring very true, both in terms of kind of how we over here in Silicon Valley can um, take for granted a whole bunch of stuff that you don't necessarily find in the rest of the world. And it also rings true because in, uh, you know, as part of uh, Threshold Ventures that used to be DFJ, DFJ was one of the venture firms that was very early from when I joined in 1999 very early in trying to establish a global presence and take venture capital and sort of export it as something that could happen all around the world. So we established as part of the DFJ network, which is now the Draper network kind of gone, Tim Draper's taking it, taking it over at this point, something like 20 different regional funds that literally had to go and be frontier innovators themselves as Alex speaks in his book. And so we've seen kind of some of these concepts uh, uh, from up close, so I'm very, very glad that we're having this conversation. Uh, Alexandre, you want to say a couple of things about yourself and then we turn it over? Yes, yes, absolutely. So very excited to be part of the conversation. Um, and thank you for, for the invitation, uh, Panayoti. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Blueground. I guess Blueground is, uh, is a real estate tech company that started in a frontier uh, market, if you want, as uh, Alex Alexander uh, calls it. Uh, so we feel, I feel like when I was reading the book, is I felt like a lot of the things were actually really applicable to to our to my story and many people that are in the call today. So really excited to participate um, today. I think the you know the concepts that were really run through uh, to me were things like you know and we all seen like not being able to have enough funding like as Andreas was saying before, which quite opposite to Silicon Valley. And I think Alexander will share more about that. Um, different talent pool and all these interesting things that we had to deal with different ways. And I'm really excited about the conversation today. So um, I guess we're going to be able to tackle these aspects and see how it also uh, affects Endeavor and what we can do going forward. So Alexander, maybe you want to start giving us a little bit of um, background on, on yourself and uh, you know how, how the whole idea with the book started with uh, out in a bit. Happily. And, and first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm a huge admirer of Endeavor and the work that uh, you're all doing around the world. Linda um, actually was a reader on the book and, and one of the endorsers. Alan Taylor, who's part of the Callus Fund, is a close friend and, and someone that um, I counseled and I actually referenced a bunch of the work that, <laughs> that Endeavor does and a, and a bunch of uh, Endeavor entrepreneurs and hopefully in the sequel, uh, many more from Greece, uh, in, including you, Alex. Um, so really delighted to be here. Um, so by, by day, I'm a venture capitalist. I live in the Bay Area, but I spend uh, most of my time investing in startups around the world. I work for a VC fund called Cathay Innovation, which is Paris-based, global. We invest 
um, a third in Asia, a third Europe, a third North America. We also have a Pan-Africa fund and a LATAM uh, presence too. Um, and then before that, I was at Omidyar Network, which uh, as, as a sign of the small world, we were also um, big backers of Endeavor uh, since the beginning when I was at ON. Um, so, so full circle on that. So that's my, my day job. Um, outside of work, I, um, uh, I teach entrepreneurship at the Middlebury Institute for International Studies, which is Middlebury College's graduate program in the West Coast. And a little bit through both those lenses, on, on the one hand, uh, investing in entrepreneurs around the world, and, and in the other, kind of working with would-be entrepreneurs that were going to launch their business, I was getting really frustrated that um, I always wanted to share lessons and best practices and things that I was seeing, um, but everything I had to share was incredibly Silicon Valley-centric. It was um, focused on a time and a place in a very particular type of acetylized software-based startup that wants to grow extraordinarily fast. And yet around the world, um, innovation is scaling. There's 480 startup ecosystems around the world that are thriving. Um, there's over a million venture-backed startups. And it isn't, it isn't just that um, big startups are rising around the world. It is some of the biggest, right? In 2013, um, you would have been correct thinking that most of the action was in the Valley. Um, four startup ecosystems uh, created all billion dollar business. Today, that number is 85. It's really moved around the world. And some, of the, some of the biggest businesses too. The biggest ed tech business in the world is in India. The biggest credit led digital bank is in Brazil. The world's biggest robotic process automation company is from Romania. And uh, you know, the, obviously the biggest super apps come from China. And so we're seeing not only big businesses but the biggest businesses getting built around the world. But they're getting built in different contexts. Um, and often in contexts that have um, historically less capital and uh, less depth of trained, been there, done that, started from the capital. Um, and, and that's changing. Um, more macroeconomic shocks in some reasons, et cetera. And in that context, I think it takes a different playbook to scale and succeed around the world. And I, I think no one is telling the stories of these global entrepreneurs. So as part of the project, I interviewed about 200 folks from around the world, mostly folks leading some of the biggest businesses, a uh, few hundred million, couple billion or have exited. Um, and uh, you know, I'm not an entrepreneur myself, I've, uh, but I've had the great fortune of working alongside and, and, and serving a bunch of entrepreneurs. And what I tried to do with the book is really channel their voices and their stories. Um, and we cover a bunch of different tactics um, as part of it around what are some of the lessons learned that work um, and, and why. So that, that, was, that was really the reason I, I wrote the book was to start this conversation and, and have a bunch of these kind of conversations and, and channel the learnings of, of what folks around the world are doing um, and hopefully share lessons. I'll pause there. So, so t tell us a little bit about that, Alex, in terms of you know, how these companies are out innovating Silicon Valley and what are some of the, let's say, differences that you found in terms yeah. of how they're doing it versus how we're used to doing things here. Yeah, totally. And maybe for context, you know, I, one of the gross uh, simplifications I make in the book is I, um, I talk about this concept of the frontier, right? Of uh, there's Silicon Valley and the history of innovation. I chose the word frontier because we often think of California as the frontier. Um, and I think, I think this new frontier of innovation is everywhere else, is, is really where we're building some thriving, uh, world-changing businesses and, and strong startup ecosystems. Uh, but obviously within the frontier, there's, uh, it's a very heterogeneous um, uh, landscape. And to take, to take another gross simplification, you might say, look, there's, um, I, I, I did strategy consulting, so I, I'm going to do it in a two by two matrix, but uh, in, in the past. But uh, you might say, look, there's developed uh, startup countries uh, and more developing uh, countries. And then there's more developed startup ecosystems and, and more emerging startup ecosystems. And within that, you might put something like Silicon Valley, um, and a couple other places uh, kind of top right. In the book, I profile even Pyongyang in North Korea. You might say like that's bottom, bottom left, right? Very emerging country, very emerging startup ecosystem. And then between there, there's a lot of uh, differences, places like Bangalore, right? That have very strong startup ecosystems in a developing market context. And Winnipeg, where I'm from, for instance, in Canada, um, you know, developed country, very nascent startup ecosystem. Um, and uh, it'd be great to have your, uh, your thoughts on, 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 on where we'll put different parts of Greece uh, on that spectrum, but within that, there's a lot of heterogeneity. Um, but uh, um, but what I think entrepreneurs have in common are some of those dimensions that I talked about around uh, startup ecosystem, uh, assets, uh, around culture of entrepreneurship and that getting built, around uh, br broader challenges and risks and things like that. And within that, um, the playbook looks different. So some of the dimensions I explore in the book are what businesses are getting built. So before we even talk about the how, um, the problems that entrepreneurs choose to select. Um, second are some of the tactics on how they build, 
Um, so, you know, in the Valley, we talk about blitz scaling and growing at any cost, even with unsustainable unit economics. I explore kind of this model I see emerging uh, uh, with the camel, you know, how people are thinking about when to expand internationally versus staying local, um, how to build teams. So uh, on, on a lot of these different vectors, which we can double click on, um, I think there's conventional wisdom in the Valley that works extraordinarily well in that context. And I think there's an emerging playbook that looks different around the world. And um, so Alexander, on one of the main difference, let's say on the frontiers ecosystem is that there are some, or some of the differences are, um, for example, and you mentioned a few in the book, it's like, you know, the lack of available financing compared to, you know, Silicon Valley, um, the macro uncertainty that we have, especially in some of the emerging markets around the world. And, uh, you know, even a lower acceptance of entrepreneurship. So how have you seen um, frontier innovators overcoming these, yeah. these issues? And maybe I don't know if you want to tackle that first or you want to talk a little bit about, because you mentioned just before that even the types of companies that uh, are being built are different. So maybe yeah. we can start from that and then talk a little bit about the problems. Yeah, absolutely. And, and by the way, something we can also talk about are um, how we as ecosystem builders should think about how to build startup ecosystems uh, that look different with, with different resources, how VCs should think about their model as well, which I think could be a fun conversation to think about. But um, to tackle the two questions, one, what's getting built? And then two, around this question of less capital and having to build sustainability and resilience. I'll, I'll touch on both. Um, the first concept um, I introduced in the book, it's the first chapter is this notion of being a creator versus disruptor, how innovation is framed. Um, in Silicon Valley, uh, there's this notion that uh, you have to disrupt. And it comes from Clayton Christensen's research at, at HBS. It wasn't about technology. It was about a totally different industry, the steel making industry, where he looked uh, and he said, look, there's this big integrated steel mills. They're not serving part of the market. And these little mini bills took the bottom in the market, disrupted the business model, grew and scaled, and then overtook the whole thing. Um, and it has this really beautiful modern day David and Goliath narrative that has really caught um, uh, the zeitgeist of, of, of how innovation is getting built and what people are doing. Um, and it's one of the reasons that in Silicon Valley, less than 20% of billion dollar businesses are in financial services, healthcare, agriculture, education, in a lot of kind of pretty key industries. Um, in many emerging startup ecosystems, that number is flipped. It's, it's not, you know, it's not 80, 20, but, but it's very much, it's, it's much more dominant in, uh, in ecosystems where they're serving on, when folks are on serving, uh, pretty strong, acute, underserved needs. In Sub-Saharan Africa, just to take one example, it's almost 70% um, in those same industries um, among the biggest startups. And so there's a little bit of question of this uh, problem selection. It's more than semantics. It's actually taking a lens of uh, building products and services, uh, often with a mass market feel, often with a uh, uh, solving something that is uh, not solved formally in, in the economy and build, you know, be, being the shoulders of giants upon which others build. So there's a little bit of this, I, I, I think question on what problems are getting solved and how entrepreneurs are thinking about it. On the second one, um, this notion of building sustainability and resilience. Um, and it'd be really interesting to hear the stories of entrepreneurs on, on, on this call as well and whether or not this re resonates. Um, I talk about the camel versus the unicorn. Uh, so the unicorn is in Silicon Valley, right? It, it's a billion dollar business. Um, so it's a numerical value, but it comes with a lot of baggage on how you get to that number. Um, a philosophy of, of building startups. And, and that philosophy is underpinned by um, growth at all costs, where it's okay to have unsustainable unit economics in service of growth, where it's okay to burn uh, lots of cash in service of growth, where it's okay to take a more short-term approach in service of growth. And that works very well in an ecosystem with lots of capital or culture around real estate, like all, all these kind of assets. Um, in the book, I posit this notion of building a camel instead of a unicorn. Um, and, and so why, why did I choose the camel? I think for one, it's a real animal. Um, two, when times are good, they can sprint across the desert. They drink water faster than other, other, any other animal. Like they're still focused on growth and building world shaking industries, but they do it on this foundation of sustainability and resilience on a foundation of um, uh, sustainable unit economics, managed burn, long-term approach. Um, one story I like, I often think of on-demand delivery. Um, as an in, in, incredibly uh, profligate <laughs> uh, business model where, you know, there's, there's growth at all costs. I interviewed uh, the folks from uh, Grubhub uh, and Mike Evans, who was the co-founder and COO, talked a lot about their growth story and how um, at every point in their fundraise and their scale, uh, they were profitable and every raise was for a specific purpose. It was for 
uh, expansion to another city. It was for uh, a small acquisition or what have you. Um, and I asked him, you know, why didn't, why didn't you just raise a lot more capital and, and scale and get there a little bit faster? And he said, I could have, you know, it took him about 10 years to IPO. He's like, I could have done it in eight years, uh, but I would have done so tremendously more risk. And that's really what I'm, I'm talking about in the book is building great companies, but doing it in a risk adjusted way that makes sense for the entrepreneurs, that makes sense for the investors, et cetera. Um, I think there's this temptation in Silicon Valley of looking at stories like Uber and say, wow, like, how did they get there? And then you look at the method and this, a lot of this blitz scaling and growth at all costs, and it's worked very well. But if you repeated that story a hundred times across a bunch of different macroeconomic environments and a bunch of other circumstances, how often would we get to that outcome? And I think that you can more reliably get to that outcome, particularly in what I call the frontier using this camel approach. And so that's really how, how, how I think about it. I, th I think that's a, a very good point about not extrapolating or making rules out of exceptions, right? The exceptions tend to be the ones that get all the press in the end, but then the 99 or 999 others <laughs> that try to do the same that didn't work, no one cares about, right? So it's a very good point. Another good point you make, so you talk in the book about this camel versus unicorn. Yeah. Another thing you talk about is the importance of like the eight teams versus eight players. Yeah. Um, can, can you tell us a little more about how this is different from how things might be here and what yeah. implications that has to places like Greece or other kind of frontier markets in terms of how people choose their coworkers? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and by the way, one, which is one last, last remark on the, on the um, point of extrapolating, right? Like Reed Hoffman and Chris Yeh, who wrote Blitzscaling, um, I think have a really interesting and important point. Chris Yeh was actually an advisor and like I worked with him on uh, this camel approach in, in New Link. But in their books, they talk very, very firmly around, look, this model works of blitzscaling in specific scenarios. Uh, winner takes all markets, lots of competitors that are getting very well funded. And in that context, you think of Airbnb or, 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 or some others, it actually makes sense uh, to scale really fast. I think that the problem is, is that we've extrapolated that, that thing that model, which I think is appropriate for 1% of venture-backed startups, which are themselves, as you said, Andres, 1% of all startups, and we've applied it far too generally. Um, so I, I don't actually think it makes sense for a big chunk of the even venture-backed businesses. Um, so I, I'll make, I'll make, I'll make that, that one thought, um, because I, I think it is appropriate for a narrow set of things um, as well. Um, the team's question, I think, is so important. Um, this survey around, uh, in, you know, with emerging market entrepreneurs, in very capital constrained markets talked about the biggest problems that entrepreneurs face. And in the early days, right, it's, it, it's uh, people and it's capital. But as businesses scale, capital becomes easier, um, but the people, re people challenge becomes bigger and bigger. This is in some ways uh, in the endeavor zone of uh, companies, of, of scaling companies, one of the biggest, and I would argue the biggest challenge of, of, of building teams. Um, and the difference is in many startup ecosystems, there isn't the same been there, done that uh, pool of folks, right? If you think of Winnipeg uh, in the middle of Canada, if I was trying to hire a CMO uh, for my business, there aren't 500 of them the way there are in the Valley. Uh, there's not 50, there might be five and they're probably working on my competitors. Um, and so you have to think creatively around how you, how you manage that. Um, and, uh, and, and what I've seen is entrepreneurs thinking differently about uh, how they uh, recruit and identify pipeline, um, how they retain, incentivize, and then lastly around uh, building distributed teams. Um, and maybe I'll double click on the last one because I think it's I think it's relevant in COVID <laughs> COVID nineteen era that we're all living. Um, you know, the whole world has shifted towards fully remote in response to COVID nineteen, um, but I think it misses the point of the story that in many startup ecosystems around the world building in a distributed fashion. And, and there's a spectrum there. One is remote at the full extreme, but actually having multiple offices, having uh, 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 some portion of the team distributed or whatever has been best practice forever. Um, and it's because it isn't a philosophical thing. Often it's practicality. Um, taking the Winnipeg example, if I, um, you'd be forced to look outside uh, the city to find uh, a CMO and you'd build a team wherever they are. And so you'd build kind of the distributed muscle um, in mind from the get-go. Um, and I think that muscle, right, this is an example of, I mean, I think a lot of the themes in the book are examples of, this is really tough. Um, this is more adversity than you might face in the Valley, but it actually builds a muscle that I think leads to a more resilient, sustainable business. So when you get hit with COVID-19, you already have some of this built-in built in muscle memory. And um, as we shifted towards COVID in the Valley, it's no surprise to me that some of the best companies 
um, at doing fully remote, we're from some of these emerging startup ecosystems. Think of you know in the US, US right? Like Basecamp out of Chicago or Zapier out of Missouri. Um, because they had to do it all along, but that actually positioned them well. And one other example of why I think it's important to learn uh, lessons from entrepreneurs around the world. Um, just on that point, fully uh, can fully relate to the distributed teams. Um, I mean, we started in Greece and as we're scaling and, and expanding in new markets, we're actually creating teams as we're uh, scaling. I don't know if you've seen that before, but uh, for example, we have engineering and a lot of back office work in Athens and accounting. In Turkey, we set up like a supply chain and procurement piece. Then we have a managerial piece in the US. And I think that's a little bit linked to the other point that you made in the book that uh, the, the camels, as you call them, are typically, or some of, the, some of them, they're typically going global from day one. So they're thinking yeah. about multiple markets. And again, uh, kind of really relate to that, like as I started in Greece, but very early, you know, it's a smaller market. For, it's a relatively small market for us. So we had to think more um, regionally and then, and then more globally. How do you think that changes, let's say, uh, how businesses like, like Blue Ground and other people have on the call, like uh, how they grow and how they develop? Yeah, and, and, and I think that's such an interesting question. And actually, I'd love to hear more about, uh, about your story uh, too, because it sounds like there's some really interesting lessons there. Uh, but I think this is another example, right, of facing a constraint, um, facing a constraint, um, and then that ends up turning into an advantage. Um, I alluded to the, the Romania startup, uh, UiPath, uh, I interviewed Daniel Dines, this, the founder, and he talked a lot about the fact that because he was based in Romania, a smaller market, he had to build the muscle, Alex, that you're talking about, um, of being able to build a product, a culture, an organization that can scale across markets from day one. I mean, you think of some of the Silicon Valley competitors, um, I think one of the reasons that UiPath out-innovated and, and has become, you know, arguably the fastest growing enterprise company of all times is because of that muscle. And a lot of these themes not all of them, but a lot of them intersect. I actually think that building distributed teams um, helps you as a company build that muscle of working across geographies, called cross-cultural understanding, et cetera, that reinforces your ability to scale across borders too. Um, so 100% uh, uh, on, on that. And I think we're gonna see a lot more um, of these, uh, these cross-border plays um, around the world as, as they scale. Um, and it's been, if, if you look at a lot of the, um, iconic companies and a lot of uh, emerging ecosystems. Um, a big part of that story is that um, I think of, you know, Singapore, for instance, among all the billion dollar businesses there, um, I think I did the count and it was uh, eight of them had launched their second country by year two, which is unheard of in the Valley. And by the way, the way they built their teams, um, a lot of the Jakarta based businesses had a big chunk of their tech development team uh, in Bangalore. Um, and so a really, really kind of leveraging uh, some of these skills in tandem um, as they scale. Let me, uh, looking at the time, we're about halfway through. I know we have a lot of people, we're about 20, 30 people on here, 26 to 28, depending. Uh, a number of you are only on audio. I'd like to make this uh, uh, a, a, an interactive conversation. So while I ask a question, if, if people on the call can use maybe the participant feature, the raise hand, just so we're not all jumping in because it's kind of hard. Most people are on, on audio, so it's hard to tell who's, who wants to jump in. So if you click on participants, you know, on the bottom right, there's a raise hand feature. I'll be monitoring it. And uh, between Alex and I, we can kind of ask different people to jump in. But in the meantime, as you guys are thinking about how all this stuff may relate to your businesses or Greece specifically or other questions you may have, uh, just to, to, to ask the next question, one of the things we didn't talk about, Alex, is the concept of a full stack, right? You talk about how when you're at the frontier, it's difficult to rely on innovation of others and kind of, kind of build on the shoulders of giants and just do the little next thing, but rather you need to build a full stack. What, what do you mean by that? And how does that relate to some of the success stories you saw? Um, and this, by the way, is another example, right, of, man, it's really tough. It's tough to build a startup everywhere, but man, is it really even tougher to build it in more emerging startup ecosystems. Um, and what is this notion of the, the full stack of having to build enabling infrastructure just to build the ultimate product? Um, think of Flipkart in India, right? The, the e-commerce giant. Um, uh, when I interviewed Binny Bansal, one of the co-founders, he talked about the fact that he had to build, uh, there's no formal addresses for a big chunk of his customers. So he had to figure out a way to manage addresses. Uh, a lot of his customers didn't have bank accounts. So he had to figure out a way to manage cash. Uh, for cash on delivery. And by the way, there wasn't a, uh, 
uh, USPS type thing like, like Amazon leveraged at the beginning of the US and you had to build his own delivery from the beginning. And so all the things that Amazon's building today as a gi ginormous company, he had to build from day one um, to scale and just to be able to do the same thing. Um, my, uh, I'll, I'll give you one other example, which, which uh, yeah, I, I spent a lot of my time thinking about FinTech and uh, a, a business in Brazil called Guia Bolso was trying to build the Brazilian version of a mint.com, a personal finance manager, like one app, you could see all the things. Um, in the US, if you want to build that, it's reasonably easy. There's actually hundreds of these co little companies that are doing this. Um, you can plug into Plaid or Yodli uh, for the back end and just plug into a bunch of bank accounts. Um, you can monetize by, by offering loans and customized products pretty easily because there's a ton of companies that will do that. Um, and you can figure out people's credit score because, you know, while the credit scoring infrastructure is not perfect, um, it's pretty good um, and it's readily accessible. In Brazil, uh, ben and Tiago, the founders, who are Endeavor entrepreneurs, which uh, why, why I mentioned them, they're, they're in, in, in the collective family. To be able to do that, they had to build their own uh, bank infrastructure, um, which is extremely hard. Um, they then had to figure out credit. There wasn't a credit score uh, the way we have in the US, for instance. So they had to, it was you're either on a blacklist, you're uh, in default or you're not. And there was nothing in range. So they had to build kind of a credit karma-like platform to give people insights on what they could get. And then there wasn't a ready market uh, of folks ready to onboard on loans. So they had to what, build their own white label solution just to build a PFM. Um, and so it's that, it's, it's that enabling infrastructure that I think makes it harder in a lot of ecosystems, both kind of digital and, and, and kind of digital, you know, digital plus, plus uh, uh, physical, like, like the flip card world. Um, but uh, I think this is an area where there is a silver lining, where if you do all that work, you end up having a little bit more of a resilient business and a moat. You know, the mountain's that much harder to climb, but when, when you're at the top um, uh, and you've built something, it becomes harder to displace as well. And so that's one of the advantages, I think, um, of that, despite the fact that it's much harder. I'm realizing I said the raise hand for folks, but I'm realizing if a lot of people are actually just using the phone to call in, then they're not going to be able to do that. So I'll take that back. Just unmute yourself and jump in if you have a comment, a question, a disagreement, if something you want to share from your company in terms of how this stuff may relate to you or even how it created advantages or disadvantages, just jump in. But Alex C., I wonder if, 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 if we can start with you and, and you can share some of the, because I know you guys in building Blue Ground, I mean, you obviously had to, to do a lot of these things. As you said, you had to think globally day one, but what are some distributed teams, right? But what are some of the other things that kind of ring through for you in terms of things you had to do that were different, ended up being helpful but also, frankly, I'd love to hear the challenges, right? Because it, it's difficult to build a full stack. It's difficult to, to you know, uh, 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 upfront as a small company, take on a problem that's much broader than what an equivalent one in Silicon Valley might have had to do. So you, I see yeah. Kono, I see Marco Veremis, I see Nick Grandakis, I see a lot of people here who build companies starting from frontier markets. So I'd love to hear from you guys about it. Yeah, let me, I just want to add one point. I know that's definitely relate to a lot of the, the points that uh, Alexander is, is mentioning. I think I mentioned already a few. Uh, I can add one more, which is it's something that I, uh, whenever I, I go uh, and talk to different endeavor entrepreneurs, um, you know, different offices, I get a lot of questions. I had a um, very recently discussion with them, some endeavor, some different entrepreneurs from Italy. It's a lot about, a lot about funding. So funding is a big thing. And uh, in our sector, um, where we basically offer beautiful design apartments for, for, uh, for stays of a month and above, and we kind of in the broader Airbnb sector uh, and the different flavors to it, um, we have been seeing competitors not doing better than us, actually being uh, performing worse than us, raising like huge rounds. And we were at a situation where we, you know, starting from, from Greece, it was difficult for us to access that that same uh, amount of capital. So that was a thing that was um, in my mind, I think in most entrepreneurs' mind, especially in the early days. So the way to, and we had to be very resourceful, exactly as, as it said, it mentioned in the book, right? We had to, instead of like raising equity financing to scale, we actually found ways to scale along with our suppliers, in our case, our landlords, or scale along with our guests and, and, and leverage working capital in order to be able to scale. So. That was one thing that we found. It was very, we had to tweak the rules of the market effectively. Like we did things that, uh, to, get, to get, make it more specific, like when we onboard and lease an apartment or work with the landlord. Now, 
the landlord's finance for the furniture, which is a big cost for us, a big upfront uh, cost for us. So that's something that no one else was doing. Was doing, and we had to kind of think and be very social and really push in these directions to be able to scale. And of course, um, in the long run, these are great, great qualities to have because you do end up being a more valuable business. You can do more with less. Um, but that process is difficult and especially can be a little bit demotivating when you see what happens on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, so that was one experience. It took us a little bit of time, but at the end of the day, I think the resilience uh, really uh, and the persistence kind of you build that in your DNA as an organization and it can be helpful in the future. And uh, before opening to others to they can share their experience, I just have one more question for Alex. I think we talked a lot about good things that happen in the frontier markets and you know the camel uh, analogy which is great making sure you have solid unit economics and all the things that are very important and uh, did you see something that frontier innovators could do better like do we carry any uh, baggage if you want from coming out of this uh, you know more difficult conditions um what have you seen in, in, in your experience um I'm a, I'm a venture capitalist, so I'm perennially optimistic. Uh, so I'll start with that. I'll start with that lens. But but to be honest, actually, a lot of the things that I talk about in the book are lessons that folks are are um, building and some of the best practices. But actually, to be honest, a lot of these are very nascent trends too, uh, where not everyone's doing it this way, and 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 it's really tough. And across a bunch of these dynamics, um, I actually think uh, uh, three thoughts. I think one. Um, I think some of the camel conversation we're talking about, I think, is best practice um, in in a lot for many startups. Depend, you know, depending on the sector. Um, I actually think that one of the things that's dangerous is seeing what's happening in the valley and then saying, "Hey, look, I'm going to copy paste it here and do the same kind of thing without adapting it." Um, and I think startups get in trouble uh, when that happens. There's a, I think, there's some endeavor research actually around pace of fundraising, and one of the things that surprised me was I, my hypothesis had been, oh, uh, founders in emerging markets are gonna, or in emerging startup because are gonna um, uh, fundraise much less often uh, than in the Valley because it's so much harder. But actually the data was the opposite. It was fundraising much more often. And the reality was it's always small rounds um, that took a while to close. Um, and, and I actually think, you know, one of the challenges is I think venture capitalists in emerging startup because we need to rethink how their model works too. Um, some of the themes I talk about in, for teams, uh, um, I think we're in the early innings of this. And I think we're gonna, you know, by the time I write the sequel, <laughs> I think we're gonna have some, some, uh, some different best practices there. Um, it is really tough to build a startup anywhere. I think it is even harder to do it um, in emerging startup because, of, but I think we're seeing some of these, um, uh, these best practices starting to emerge. Um, and, and, and I think that's leading to more success. Uh, but I think we're going to need to see some, some more time for some of these to, to come out and, and, and build and, and actually be more nuanced over the next over the next couple of years. Um, so I, I, I think that's I think I think the big challenge is around this notion of uh, trying to replicate what's hap- what's successful in the valley and, and, and copy pasting it um, too too quickly. Um, and I'll just give one just very tactical thought around some of the born global and some of the uh, other things, um, which is. You know, in many ways, like the, the the book is not a recipe book. It's not follow do A B C and then you'll get Z. Um, it's much more of a menu. Like see what resonates, and, and some of it will be re- some of it will be relevant to your business model. Others won't. Um, and I think on the born global one, for instance, um, I actually think one of the one of the things that's like a, that, that's a um, a risk is misunderstanding some of these dynamics. Um, so in the case of Uber, for instance. Um, which tried to scale globally. I think one of the challenges in that business model is I think they misunderstood fundamentally the nature of the network effects. Um, and that's one of the reasons that there is actually a dominant player in LATAM with 99, a dominant player in the Middle East, uh, Kareem, a dominant player in Southeast Asia, uh, Grab and Gojek. And the biggest one in the world is Didi in China. Um, and, and Uber's actually had to either buy or retreat or partner as they did with a couple of these examples. And it's because the network effects in this particular case are local. It doesn't matter to me in Silicon Valley I, mean, I travel a lot, so maybe it matters a little bit from simplicity, but it doesn't matter to me how many more drivers there are in Jakarta, uh, but it does matter a lot very locally. I mean, so I think in a lot of these businesses, understanding the nuance on how some of these themes work, I think, you know, very tactically on the Born Global one, um, the nature of the network effects, local versus global, um, I think it's one of the reasons there's one Google and there's a lot of uh, um, very local players on that. I think the, um, 
the nature of the capital intensity, I think uh, local regulations and things like that, and, and some of that complexity. So Alice, your question, I think some of these is, is also kind of misunderstanding the, 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 the dynamics that play on a couple of these and, and why certain models work uh, versus, versus don't uh, on, a uh, on a couple of these dimensions. Really, really good. Uh, can we open it up and see if uh, if other people want to jump in with with comments, questions, agreements, disagreements? Yeah, Conor, is that your hand? And all yeah. the tough questions, I'll send to uh, to the other Alex. <laughs> yeah, sure. So first of all, thanks for the for, for, thanks for the call. It's very insightful. Uh, actually, yeah, there's lots of points here. Uh, I couldn't resonate more and I couldn't agree more with Alex uh, on what he said about fundraising. Uh, so. Uh, I had the same thing uh, when uh, when I was first fundraising about the um, the company. It took us six months and 103 no's to get uh, uh, oh. the first yes, and the first yes was 50k from uh, Mike from <laughs> myself. Uh, so th that was that was a great experience. So w relating to this, um, I wanted to ask from an investor or uh, perspective, when you're wearing your investment hat. Uh, how do you see uh, opportunities now abroad um, in other, you know, in other jurisdictions, in other countries like Greece? Uh, would it be easier for us founders in next endeavors, pun intended, uh, when we're going to be fundraising for the next uh, for the next startup? Um, and by the way, what does your what does your business do uh, in your fundraising? Uh, oh yeah, uh, so we started a company like uh, seven or eight years ago in the advertising space in the mobile advertising. Uh, sector native uh, ads uh, we after three and a half years we sold the company to an organization and then i stayed for three and a half to four years and now i took a break for six months doing nothing but fishing uh, in the <laughs> APM. it's great and uh, and now we're thinking of starting up the the next thing actually we're in the ideation phase uh, cool. and yes fundraising will be something that we'll be looking at uh, the next few months yeah no, that makes that makes sense. Okay. Congratulations on uh, on the successful exit on the on the first one. Um, so I I I, uh, I think the fundraising dynamic is such a challenge in uh, many ecosystems. It's changing, which is the good news. Um, but you know, Silicon Valley still has even in the U.S. the lion's share, um, and then with a couple other ecosystems making up the big chunk of the rest. Um, and the same dynamic is true in emerging startup ecosystems. I actually think it's going to change. Um, and I believe the VC model is going to see a couple of different dimensions of change depending. I think there's going to be on one VCs that take a global first approach and, and the fund I work at is a good example of that, right? We, um, our buckets, by the way, are Asia, Europe, uh, it kind of out, out of the global fund and rest of world. Um, I'm based in Silicon Valley and that's the bit that I, that I do, but we do that on purpose because really it's this notion that you know, entrepreneurship is global. And I think there's going to be more and more of these funds that take a global first lens. We've seen wave one of that. Um, like in the fund I was at before, Omidyar, where we had a bunch of vertical focus funds. I was doing only fintech, but most of my work was global. I, I think we saw that. I think we're going to see more uh, funds that are looking um, globally because I think the nature of innovations, a lot of these things are happening in waves within many years, from a uh, couple of years from each other. Um, you know, ride sharing, for instance, and, and, and a wave of great companies getting built around the world. And so I, I, think, I, think, I think we'll have to, by necessity, build at least multi-market funds if it's regional or global. So I think that's going to be one dimension. I think too, the VC model itself, um, I, I often ask my students, where, where do they think the VC model emerged from? And they'll say, well, Silicon Valley, of course. And the reality is that model is much older, right? It was adapted um, from the whaling industry. One town, New Bedford, had 70% of the US market share, which had 70% of the global share. And the reason it was so dominant is they figured out a model to have merchants um, or modern day VCs build a portfolio of whaling ships that they finance. The captains are modern day entrepreneurs. Uh, did did a big chunk of the costs and uh, the crew was paid on on the re, uh, the results and that's why by the way it's called carried interest it's, it used to be what what you could carry off the boat and uh, and and that model was was successfully adapted to the Silicon Valley model but I think that as innovation proliferates around the world we're going to see some ad adaptation on that and I think we're very early innings but we're seeing people think about longer dated funds uh, because timelines could be longer um, we're seeing shifts in how um, uh, what's the instrument that's getting invested in. Um, I, I think revenue-based financing, which derives from a totally different industry, mining, right, with royalties, has some promise for business models that might uh, 
might not want the the hockey stick approach that want you know and and and, and might want to modulate and 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 the founders might want to keep more ownership and control you know might might show some promise i think we're gonna see some evolution in who invests we've seen a little bit of wave one with impact investors and and folks like that in a lot of emerging ecosystems i think we're gonna see more around the corporate ecosystems in china um some of the big corporates are dominant players in scaling startups and they don't do it in the silicon valley way they do it by opening their ecosystem and really yeah really using a playbook beyond either buy or uh, invest in doing something kind of hybrid. Um, I think we're gonna see some evolution in a bunch of these. And so this is, this is pretty early, um, but I think that's how uh, the VC model um, should adapt. Um, this one entrepreneur I, I, I interviewed in, in East Africa, uh, who's been an entrepreneur, um, uh, Eric Herzman, I, he's actually an Endeavor entrepreneur, I believe too, but anyways, he's been an entrepreneur, a VC, an ecosystem builder. And, and he said this quote that I, um, that I liked, which is the tail shouldn't wag the dog in the sense that Entrepreneurs shouldn't develop their strategy to get VC funding. Uh, VC funding should evolve to be able to serve the entrepreneur needs and the vision of that company and, and its return profile. So I think we're going to need some evolution um, on that. And, and, and I think that's happening uh, and it's underway. Thank you, Alex. Um, I see Marcos Veremis has uh, raised his hand. So Marco, if you want to give a very brief intro, yeah, yeah. I, I, question. I, I, I think, you know, an interesting, uh, my personal experience, um, Alex was building a business called Upstream, which, uh, which uh, essentially was in the mobile marketing and commerce space, working primarily with mobile operators and addressing mostly unbanked customers. So those who don't have a, you know, who didn't have a, a way of paying beyond their mobile operator bill. Um, so no PayPal's, no credit cards, no yeah. debit cards, etc. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, all, all, almost at the same time, I had I had sort of a parallel experience with another business called Persado uh, that addressed solely the U.S. market, coming up with artificial intelligence in language, so automating language in advertising text. Um, so instead of A/B testing, etc., it was sort of more more uh, serving. Uh, 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 the, the language automatically. Now, my, in, my observation sort of out of these two experiences were, were two different worlds in terms of how uh, companies are valued. Mm -hmm. So Persado um, addressed the US market from day one and followed pretty much a Silicon Valley-like uh, path in terms of valuations. So yeah. to put it bluntly, they, 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 they started straight away with a 10x on revenues type value <laughs> today um, and brought on board Bain and board later Goldman as a private equity firm. And, you know, the company is now, I guess, pretty close to being a, a, a unicorn. At the same time, um, the company has surpassed 100 million ARR yet. Okay. Now, let's take a, a tale of a different city upstream. <laughs> that happen to be working primarily in places like Brazil and places like Nigeria and places like uh, the Middle East. Um, and the company, uh, well, we sold the company in 2015. Uh, essentially, the company at the time had 250 million in revenues. Wow. Um, yeah. It got sold exclusively on EBITDA. And in fact, and in fact you know, a cash generation, not even EBITDA, like pure cash. And, you know, it was sold at, 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 a, at a rate of 10, 10 times EBITDA. Okay, we, we were pretty happy in the sense that the company never raised any funding. So, it, it, you know, it all stayed in, in the family, let's call it, like myself, my co-founder, Alex Ratskidis, and, and our management team. And we didn't have to share that amount. But the sheer distance between how these two companies were valued is, I would say, truly shocking. Yeah. Uh, it's a tale of two cities, literally. Um, you know, one, Persado, or another company I was involved with, Workable, following the very privileged path of a Silicon Valley type valuation and company, and the other upstream, you know, the poor relative working in emerging markets, never really able to get a proper valuation. And I think Nikos Andrakis uh, would echo this with beat. Um, similar, similar, you know, similar experience. Um, and I guess my question to you is, I'm beginning to see this gap being bridged to some extent, now that I am a VC myself, 
I see that most of the companies I'm investing in are managing to somehow come closer between these two extremes, yeah. but they're certainly not in Silicon Valley territory, but they're not at upstream territory or bit territory either, for sure. <laughs> um, you know, and my, I guess my question to you is, what is your observation in terms of having looked at so many global markets? Uh, and, you know, my, my, my sense is some are now considered properly sexy. I guess Brazil is now becoming properly sexy. Uh, you know, some countries selectively are pre becoming properly sexy. But I can tell you that places like Nigeria or places like, like huge markets yeah. or even South Africa, you know, um, and other places that I've done business in like Malaysia or Indonesia certainly are not A-list countries and are not getting, that revenue is not getting the multiple uh, yeah, that yeah. it would get anywhere else, it's much lower. So yeah, just your thoughts on that. First, isn't that nuts? Uh, I it's, think so, it, yeah. it blows my mind. Uh, it, it blows, because there's such incredible businesses and to be honest, something that's growing pretty quickly at 250 in revenue and, you know, it's built on this super strong foundation that's generating cash. You know, that, that sounds like an amazing business. And by, by the way, I'll tell you, Alex, the surreal thing is at some point, both teams were based in the same building, Versado and Upstream, <laughs> right? Yeah. And the Upstream guys were like, what the hell? You know, what are we like really the poor relatives here? And the other guys were like, you know, a, a different league altogether in terms of valuations, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> And, and by the way, 10 times revenue these days seems cheap in Silicon Valley based on based on what, you know, I, I, I don't understand anything uh, anymore a little bit when it comes to some of this. Um, but to your thoughts, you know, I, I think I think you're right where, you know, I, I'm betting my career on this notion that um, there's incredible entrepreneurs everywhere around the world and there's incredible businesses to, to support as a VC. And so um, I, I'm very passionate. I, I think there's starting to be some shifts. I think um, there are some sectors that are hot. Uh, there are some um, locations that are hot. I think Brazil is one. Um, I think Singapore, um, the best teams in, you know, in, in, in Bangalore are, are, are getting very expensive valuations. I think there's a couple of sectors that are pretty hot. Um, FinTech has been kind of one of the big first waves in many emerging startup ecosystems that are having incredible valuations around the world. And, and actually, even, even in Africa, um, there's been a couple of big businesses that are getting really high valuations. Um, this is called Flutterwave, another one called Chipper that are you know, early, but are getting Silicon Valley mainstream investors and getting Silicon Valley mainstream prices. Um, so I think it's changing, um, which I think, which I think is good news. Um, I think the risk is, you know, like this tail wagging the dog. I think, I think some businesses will be great for that model and others will be great for different models and it, and it won't be appropriate to, uh, to pump a, a ton of, so I, I think there's going to be some nuance in, in, in how the VC model needs to, uh, evolve, but a hundred percent, I think that dichotomy and that difference is. Uh, absolutely befuddling to me, and so uh, I share I share your your question on it. But I think the gap will get closed as, um, you know, I, I think VCs um, uh, have a little bit of this like rear looking bias of like you know I, I'm based in Silicon Valley, where have I made money in the past, etc. And you know uh, the stat I gave at the beginning, right? In 2013, four ecosystems built a billion dollar business. Uh, now people are building really and doing incredible returns all over the world. Like 85 startup ecosystems have a billion dollar business. We're going to see some really great, at least paper games for now, but I, I believe also some, some real gains. And uh, I think that's going to, um, that prize will draw a lot more VC around the world, which I think will help close that gap. At least that's my hypothesis. And, and obviously I, Andreas through his work with the, with the, uh, the DFJ network was very early on building a lot of this too. And so I, I, I think there's a bunch of these efforts that, that are emerging that, that will be part of, Hopefully solving I think, our, you know, I think that the distortive uh, dynamic in what I'm talking about is, is quite simple. I have startups these days that I invest in, and they may the sound business decision might be for them to invest more in, let's call it South Africa, rather than the US. But it makes a lot more sense to go after the US purely for valuation purposes. And because at the end of the day, the velocity of changes as, as of growth rather has grown so much and there's such an inflation in terms of, of, of capital raised. If you wanna keep sort of uh, uh, up with, with the Joneses, right? Um, essentially, you might have to make the wrong business decision <laughs> in terms of purely commercial and go for US and not South Africa where the margins might be better and the opportunity might be better solely because that might 
ensure that you get a higher valuation, more cash in, and then ultimately maybe win the game. But I, I just wanted to highlight this distortion that, 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 that comes about um, in, in actually making day-to-day -day, day -day decisions. Uh, thanks and, a lot. You know, if, go, go ahead. I, I just, third, 30 second thing. Um, you know, it's funny, I've seen this, uh, there's a bunch of African-based startups in FinTech and Sub-Saharan app. They're choosing their second market my hypothesis would have been, you know, Nigerian startup might go to Ghana or whatever it is, or, or, or Kenyan startup regionally in East Africa. But I've seen a couple of these expanding to totally different geos, uh, one to Brazil, one to Eastern Europe, uh, what have you. And, um, you know, I, I often wonder, like, how, how this dynamic of being viewed as a global company versus a local, you know, I mean, how some of this plays out as part of the decision. And I don't know the answer, but it's... Um, uh, but it is, it is, it is interesting. I think, I think, I do think that companies that manage to be uh, make some of these transitions can can benefit from higher valuations, invest more cash, and and whatever. So it, it, it is a it is a funny thing. Sorry, Andreas, I interrupted you. Well, I was just going to comment on the um, couple things, including kind of Endeavor's role in this, because I, I also would like to kind of see if we can pull in in terms of how you know what of these concepts are also relevant in terms of how Endeavor's trying to help the companies from a sort of global network perspective, but on the the comment about kind of coming to the U.S., because we see that quite a bit, especially from countries like Israel, right? For generations of entrepreneurs, the playbook has been show some technology traction locally, maybe get some local funding, and then as quickly as you can go after the U.S. Uh, to get into a bigger market, maybe get easier funding. Now, I think Alex mentioned it before, but I mean, the, the trade-off with that is competition, right? So in, in a market where you've got, let's say, a much more liquid um, uh, availability of, of capital and where you have a lot of the sort of infrastructure that's already built for you, potentially you can get to market quicker, but so can others, right? So depending on the type of, of vertical you're going after and how important switching costs and how important kind of entry barriers are, um, it could make sense. But I wouldn't necessarily say that any business that comes to the U.S. with the exact same, you know, product in whatever vertical is guaranteed to get funded in a way that's easier, you know, cheaper or what have you. Cheaper, I mean, from the entrepreneur's perspective, meaning better, higher valuation than locally. Uh, and the point I was going to make about Endeavor's role is um, I think one of the reasons why you're seeing uh, technology valuations being so high in the U.S. is that, especially with the pandemic, the role of technology in impacting parts of the GDP that have nothing traditionally to do with traditional technology companies is being much more understood. So technology is being leveraged in so many other industries and its impact is becoming so evident, especially under the pandemic, right? You will see that. You're already seeing it in other parts of the world. I think you will continue seeing that. So especially in areas, the call them non-traditional tech spaces, like Alex was talking before about education and financial services and, uh, you know, a whole bunch of other, uh, you know, transportation, you name it. Uh, I think Endeavor seeing models of disruption that are in sort of local economies that have nothing to do with how it works in the U.S. and being able to share those stories and being able to kind of connect the right people that have similarities in markets from across the world is a unique uh, a role that, that the network can play that is very difficult for any single you know, venture capitalist as big as their fund could be to try to make that happen systematically. So uh, you know, in the end, nothing succeeds like success. You know, we, we ended up backing Baidu in China and, and, and Skype in Europe, which were kind of two of the most successful at the time venture capital exits. And the reason was because we were there early. And therefore, a lot of people were coming to us, asking us questions about how things had worked over here. There's a lot of power in information, knowledge, and understanding and being able to connect people and putting these stories together. So that, 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 that's all there. But I'd, lo I'd, love to, I'd love to hear, you know, Alex or the other Alex or anyone here, if you have ideas about what is it that Endeavor could be doing more along the lines of what we're saying and understanding some of these differences, to help the frontier entrepreneur, specifically in Greece or elsewhere. I have, I have one reaction, which is, is an appreciation of what Endeavor is doing in a lot of startup ecosystems, because I think a lot of, you know, startup ecosystem, oops, um, startup ecosystem development, my, uh, my little headphones are, are just <laughs> getting caught. Uh, 
I, I think I think the um, startup ecosystem development is rising to the top of policy agendas um, around the world, and I think there's often this uh, desire to have things that you can count. And so it's like, how do we get more startups to the top of the pipeline? How do we like uh, make better partnerships with the universe? All these things are really important. Um, but actually, I think one of the things that really moves startup ecosystems is getting mid-sized companies to be massive. Um, and in the book, I talk about this notion of like older siblings, but kind of this generation of entrepreneurs that are um, that scale, that um, end up training a bunch of folks um, in their senior management team on how to build a fast growing startup who themselves become the next generation of startups or um, or found, you know, or become angel investors or whatever. Similar to the concept of like the multiplier effect that Endeavor thinks very, very thoughtfully about. Um, I, I think we're starting to see that, by the way, um, in the Middle East coming out of Kareem, we're starting to see like a bunch of startups coming out of that. Um, I think the story um, uh, of Hernan Kaza in, 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 in Latam and Mercado Libre is starting to really become a, a powerful a powerful story. Um, and I think there's one or two of these other really, really uh, fast moving mafias that are getting built um, as a result. And, and I think that's one of the things that's important is getting kind of mid-sized companies to really get to exit. Um, if you look at the data in countries, like in China, for instance, um, you know, there's like one unicorn and, and kind of, and then nothing happened for a couple of years and there was a second. And then all of a sudden there was a critical mass around five or six. And the next year it was like seven, eight, and it just scaled exponentially. That same dynamic is happening in a lot. If you look at the numbers in Brazil, in uh, many European countries, the same dynamic is happening. And, and Daniel Dine said, look, if there's, I asked him like, what's it going to take for Romania to become the, the next, the next kind of innovation powerhouse? He said, look, you know, one company is an aberration. Uh, in people's minds, but once you have critical mass, like then it becomes. And so that's, I think, is the thing that's important is helping mid-sized companies also scale. The rest of it's also important. I don't want to discount it, but I, I, I think there's often kind of a temptation looking at Canada, for instance, um, of like a 200, 300 million dollar exit is very, it's, it's awesome. It's incredible. But if you can get one or two of those companies to also get to kind of really kind of getting to scale um, uh, and, and, and continue getting in the runaway, I think you then get some of the more of these uh, things getting built over time. So I, I think that's one of the things that I think is so powerful. The Endeavor model is helping, um, helping build scale, scaling entrepreneurs um, and, uh, and leverage the world's resources, et cetera. And so just a compliment on what you're doing. And I think that's really important. Sorry, I took up <laughs> a couple of the minutes there. Just um, and from my side, just a few thoughts. Um, maybe it's something that we need to think over the next kind of few weeks and months, what we Endeavor could do more of it. Uh, just hearing you speak about, um, you know, whether companies should enter the U.S. market just to change kind of like the funding uh, dynamic for like we we were in exactly the same position. Like we, we you know we launched in Greece, we had regional expanded. Then at some point we said like our business model works really well in Europe and, and in the Middle East. But at the same time we knew kind of we're at that growth stage, so we knew that if we wanted to really accelerate the growth because our business needs capital, so it really depends also as you said, uh, Andrea from business. Business, business standpoint, some businesses need less capital, others need more. So in our case, the expansion to the US when we did it um, just three and a half years ago was linked to, to also finding additional capital. It actually worked out, we did expand in the US. It, it was much more competitive and it is much more competitive. We did em, end up raising higher, uh, more capital and like higher valuation, so that, that worked out. But as you said, like I think it's very important for every entrepreneur to understand like whether that's really needed. And, and I guess their endeavor could um, you know, pull in entrepreneurs and, and, and that have been through this stage and kind of share their point of view with uh, our entrepreneurs are now considering like where to expand next and whether that's the right thing to do. I think that's one thing. Um, and also like, again, on the fundraising, I, I think some people in, in, in this discussion like probably you know, know all the VCs, met so many VCs and, and done quite a bit of um, uh, fundraising. I think that's something that we could, I mean, we're already doing, and they were doing a lot of things on the, on the, on the fundraising side, like we, we're getting all these lists of funds, at least in my case, all these different, like all the number of investors, introductions, but I think pulling in these entrepreneurs have been through the stage to coach up and coming entrepreneurs, I think that will be helpful in a more structured way because every case is a little bit different depending on the type of business where you're expanding for more so these are something we could do. Uh, I think we could do a little bit more going forward. Um, yeah, but this is just some my thoughts. I think that that's a broader topic that we need to think going forward. Perfect. Any? I don't know if we have any questions. From... Uh, 
Yeah, I would like to ask a, um, yeah. a question to uh, myself, uh, Alexander. Thank you so much for for your time and for your insights so far. Um, um, one one question, and perhaps I don't know where um, we're exactly at sixty minutes. Uh, maybe we can um, right. put a, a, a full stop here. But um, I'm wondering, uh, part of Endeavor is not just to help entrepreneurs scale and create all of these opportunities in, the, in, their, in their growth path, but also um, what you said, the multiplier effect, right? We really, really strongly believe that engaging and enabling entrepreneurs to give back, pay it forward and be active entrepreneurs uh, when they succeed and after their success uh, is, is a big, a big um, uh, critical success factor here. I'm wondering if you, you know, when you're observing uh, different uh, economies, um, I'm wondering if the uh, frontier innovators, if they're engaged in their local markets in a different way from other, from other, uh, uh, from entrepreneurs coming from uh, primary economies, and you know, working with, with you, looking at UiPath or looking at Spotify, the 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 amount of impact these people have in their local economies is tremendous. So, what can we do with um, the entrepreneurs that we already have in our network? That are, have accomplished so much, and they're already, you know, uh, very successful and very prominent entrepreneurs. Yeah, some, of them, should, some of them are in the call, by the way. Yeah, and it's it's such an interesting it's such an interesting uh, uh, question. You know, there's um, I think there's a big difference, right, for entrepreneurs that are scaling. Like in in Silicon Valley, there's a treadmill, and you you build the startup and then you scale, and then you know become an angel. You know, there's a lot of this kind of dimension of folks giving back in the ecosystem in the valley as well. I think the difference is uh, in many emerging startup ecosystems, people are building the treadmill, uh, building the ecosystem at the same time, um, and that's actually pretty effective. Um, uh, cities like New York and Chicago um, that are they've been building their start in Toronto actually as well. Are seeing a lot of local angel investors pre-exits being kind of mentors and things like that. So I actually think one of the things that's really powerful is being, you know, I, I think ecosystems get built around the needs of entrepreneurs and by entrepreneurs. I think Endeavor is a great way to catalyze local entrepreneurships to the boards with a framework and, and, and all the resources. But I think, you know, figuring out ways for entrepreneurs to be engaged in the community in a way that is authentic and led by entrepreneurs, I think is, um, is what's happening, and, um, and I think there's a bunch of examples around the world of things that I think are interesting. I, you know, there, uh, one of the folks that I profiled was were the folks that founded uh, Fuck Up Nights, uh, fun, uh, which is to essentially to, to start a conversation on failure uh, in markets where failure is not accepted, and and, and as a blocker of uh, of entrepreneurship, and it's become actually the largest decentralized entrepreneurship organization in terms of like having chapters all over the world. Um, uh, but it was founded by entrepreneurs uh, that, that were they were building and, and kind of for a need that they perceived in in Mexico City. Um, I think I think we're going to see more of that. I think that's the kind of stuff um, that's critical. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for having me. This has been a lot of fun. I'm happy for you to share uh, my email if, if folks want to reach out uh, to the group. I, I also have a newsletter if you're interested in some of the stuff that I'm writing. Um, that, that you know, just uh, my my website is just alexlazaro.com. Um, if, if folks are interested to kind of keep in touch, feel free to reach out or, yeah. or, or, or sign exactly. up. We've made, we've made uh, the book available to the group that we've invited in this discussion. Uh, so guys, um, uh, if you haven't downloaded the book, uh, let us know, we will share again the quotes. Um, Andreas, thank you. And Andreas and Alexis, thank you so much for um, stepping in to moderate this discussion and uh, raise the level. Uh, thank you so much for that. Alexander, thank you so much for, for um, giving offering us your time. And everyone else uh, from our network, our board members and our endeavor entrepreneurs, thank you so much for joining. Um, have a great night. We will keep it going. We will uh, invite more to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, so thank much. you for having us.